All right, cool creatures. We are ready for chapter three of Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim, the Crow and the Cat. Mrs. Frisbee looked again at the sun and saw that she faced an unpleasant choice. She, should, she could go home by the same roundabout way she had come, in which case she would surely end up walking alone in the woods, in the dark. A frightening prospect, for at night the forest was alive with danger. Then the owl came out to hunt, and foxes, weasels, and strange wild cats stalked among the tree trunks. The other choice would be dangerous too, but with luck it would get her home before dark. That would be to take a straighter route across the farmyard between the barn and the chicken house, going not too close to the house, but cutting the distance home by half. The cat would be there somewhere, but by daylight and by staying in the open away from the shrubs, she could probably spot him before he saw her. The cat. He was called Dragon. Farmer Fitzgibbon's wife had given him the name as a joke when he was a small kitten pretending to be fierce. But then he grew up and the name turned out to be an apt one. Stop playing, you two. It's story time. Pardon the interruption. Let's see, where were we? Ah, he was enormous with a huge broad head and a large mouth full of curving fangs, needle sharp. He had seven claws on each foot and a thick furry tail, which lashed angrily from side to side. In color, he was orange and white with glaring yellow eyes. And when he leaped to kill, he gave a high strangled scream that froze his victims where they stood. So this is a moment to pause and think about perspective in a story and in our experiences. So to a small mouse, a cat would be very, very frightening. And this description really makes me feel that. So I can understand how this small mouse would feel. Now, from my perspective, well, I think we all know my perspective on cats. I would describe them very, very differently. So I challenge you to think about that when you're reading stories and when you're going through your days. Think about that perspective. Think about how the way you look at things and from where you're looking at them, how that changes. All right, let's continue. But Mrs. Frisbee preferred not to think about that. Instead, as she came out of the woods from Mr. Aegis's house and reached the farmyard fence, she thought about Timothy. She thought of how his eyes shone with merriment when he made up small jokes, which he did frequently and how invariably kind he was to his small scatterbrained sister, Cynthia. The other children sometimes laughed at her when she made mistakes or grew impatient with her because she was forever losing things, but Timothy never did. Instead, he would help her find them. And when Cynthia herself had been sick in bed with a cold, he had sat by her side for hours and entertained her with stories. He made these up out of his head and he seemed to have a bottomless supply of them. Taking a firm grip on her packets of medicine, Mrs. Frisbee went under the fence and set out toward the farmyard. The first stretch was a long pasture. The barn itself square and red and big, rose in the distance to her right. 
To her left, farther off, were the chicken houses. When at length she came abreast of the barn, she saw the cattle wire fence that marked the other end of the pasture. And as she approached it, she was startled by a sudden outburst of noise. She thought at first it was a hen, strayed from the chicken yard, caught by a fox. She looked down the fence and saw that it was no hen at all, but a young crow flapping in the grass, acting most odd. As she watched, he fluttered to the top wire of the fence, where he perched nervously for a moment. Then he spread his wings, flapped hard, and took off. But after flying four feet, he stopped with a snap and crashed to the ground again, shedding a flurry of black feathers and squawking loudly. He was tied to the fence. A piece of something silvery, it looked like wire, was tangled around one of his legs, and the other end of it was caught in the fence. Mrs. Frisbee walked closer, and then she could see it was not wire after all, but a length of silver cord, probably left over from a Christmas package. The crow was sitting on the fence, pecking ineffectively at the string with his bill, calling softly to himself a miserable sound. And after a moment, he spread his wings and she could see he was going to try to fly again. Wait, said Mrs. Frisbee. The crow looked down and saw her in the grass. Why should I wait? Can't you see? I'm caught. I've got to get loose. But if you make so much noise again, the cat is sure to hear. If he hasn't heard already. You'd make noise too if you were tied to a fence with a piece of string and with night coming on. I would not, said Mrs. Frisbee, if I had any sense and knew there was a cat. Who tied you? She was trying to calm the crow, who was obviously terrified. He looked embarrassed and stared at his feet. I picked up the string. It got tangled with my foot. I sat on the fence trying to get it off, and it caught on the fence. Why did you pick up the string? The cr I think there is a cat nearby. The crow, who was very young indeed, in fact, only a year old, said wearily, because it was shiny. You knew better. I had been told. Bird brain, thought Mrs. Frisbee, and then recalled what her husband used to say. The size of the brain is no measure of its capacity. And well, she might recall it, for the crow's head was at double the size of her own. Sit quietly, she said. Look toward the house and see if you see the cat. I don't see him, but I can't see behind the bushes. Oh, if I could just fly higher. Don't, said Mrs. Frisbee. She looked at the sun. It was setting behind the tree. She thought of Timothy and of the medicine she was carrying. Yet she knew she could not leave the foolish crow there to be killed. And killed he surely would be before sunrise, just for want of a few minutes' work. She might still make it by dusk if she hurried. Come down here, she said. I'll get the string off. How? said the crow dubiously. Don't argue. I have only a few minutes. She said this in a voice so authoritative that the crow fluttered down immediately. But if the cat comes, he said, if the cat comes, he'll knock you off the fence with one jump and catch you with the next. Be still. She was already at work and her sharp teeth gnawing at the string. It was twined and twisted and twined again around his right ankle and she saw she would have to cut through it three times to get it off. As she finished the second strand, the crow, who was staring toward the house, suddenly cried out, I see the cat! Quiet, whispered Mrs. Frisbee. 
Does he see us? I don't know. Yes, he's looking at me. I don't think he can see you. Stand perfectly still. Don't get in a panic. She, she did not look up, but started on the third strand. He's moving this way, fast or slow. Medium. I think he's trying to figure out what I'm doing. She cut the last strand, gave a tug, the string fell off. There, you're free. Fly off and be quick. But what about you? Maybe he hasn't seen me. But he will. He's coming closer. Mrs. Frisbee looked around. There was not a bit of cover anywhere near. Not a rock, nor a hole, nor a log. Nothing at all closer than the chicken yard. And that was in the direction the cat was coming from. And a long way off. Look, said the crow, climb on my back, quick, and hang on. Mrs. Frisbee did what she was told, first grasping the precious packages of medicine tightly between her teeth. Are you on? Yes. She gripped the feathers on his back, felt the beat of his powerful black wings, felt a dizzying upward surge, and shut her eyes. Just in time, said the crow. And she heard the angry scream of the cat as he leapt at where they had just been. It's lucky you're so light. I can scarcely tell you're there. Lucky indeed, thought Mrs. Frisbee. If it had not been for your foolishness, I'd never have gotten into such a scrape. However, she thought it wise not to say so under the circumstances. Where do you live? asked the crow. In the garden patch near the big stone. I'll drop you off there. He banked alarmingly, and for a moment, Mrs. Frisbee thought he meant it literally. But a few seconds later, so fast does the crow fly, they were gliding to earth a yard from her front door. Thank you very much, said Mrs. Frisbee, hopping to the ground. It's I who should be thanking you, said the crow. You saved my life. Ah, uh, but that's not quite even. Yours wouldn't have been risked if it had not been for me. Me and my piece of string. And since this was just what she had been thinking, Mrs. Frisbee did not argue. We all help one another against the cat, she said. True, just the same, I am in debt to you. If the time ever comes when I can help you, I hope you will ask me. My name is Jeremy. Mention it to any crow you see in the woods, and he will find me. Thank you, said Mrs. Frisbee. I will remember. Jeremy flew away to the woods and she entered her house taking the three doses of medicine winter with her. What an adventure Mrs. Frisbee just had and she made a new friend. So that is pretty exciting for her. I hope that you enjoyed meeting Jeremy and their escape from the cat. Before you go, let's talk about a couple of words that we have in our chapter that I'm going to put into Spelling City. Actually, you know what? Let's do another video for that one. All right, I'll see you soon, cool creatures. I love you dearly, and so does Gracie. Bye-bye.